Hi, I'm Ben Fuda, host of PBS Wisconsin's online gardening series, Let's Grow Stuff. Welcome to this year's virtual Wisconsin Garden and Landscape Expo. I hope you'll enjoy this special educational presentation, and remember, you can leave your questions for our presenter at any time by typing them into the chat, and we'll ask them in a live Q&A at the end of the session. Also, don't forget to stick around and check out everything this virtual event has to offer. From inspiring garden tours to an interactive exhibitor mall, there's something for everyone. And thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy the show. Sigali Sogwek. Hakahuni ni yungat sa gwe huene o kalili zaizi ni yungat sa sunuge, wagwaho ni wagita loda, oni ota aga ni wagikun joda, dalaguane ni wagenio. Greetings, everyone. My Oneida name is Hatkahuni, and my English name is Leah Zaizi. I am Wolf Clan, and I'm Oneida, and I'm from the place where the ducks gather. Sigoli, so quick. Yo estoy yo well yet, ni yungs. Waniate aga ni. Hi, my name is Laura Manthi, and I'm also from the Oneida Nation. And I'm glad to be here today. So today we wanted to share with you uh, a little bit about indigenous agriculture from our perspective. Um, and just to let you know that we are um, definitely beginners. We're learning a lot of teachings as we go along. So this is just a little bit of what we picked up along the way. So today's journey in this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about who we are and then get into the traditional agricultural system, systems of the Haudenosaunee people. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing today and how that is helping regenerate agricultural connections on our reservation and even outside our reservation. So we are mom and daughter, we're Oneida Nation citizens, and we are co-founders of a small grassroots cooperative called Ohilagu. And that means among the corn stalks in Oneida. So what do you have here is a beautiful painting by the late Bruce King, and it is our creation story. Sky Woman came from the heavens and she uh, fell through a hole in the sky. The geese saw her coming and they opened their wings and caught her on their back. In her hands, you'll see she has some seeds and some flowers and some plants. Those are the same plants, seeds and flowers that we grow to this day. She was the original inhabitant of our uh, world, and she brought all the medicine and all the things that we needed to survive with her. Um, the turtle gave up his um, bag for her to land on. The muskrat went down deep into the ocean and got some soil and brought it back up in his little paw, and she danced on it, and she created Turtle Island. So when you look at a map of the United States and Canada, if you use your imagination, you can see a turtle there. So in this picture, you'll see that she's pregnant. And um, she had her family when she landed um, on the earth. So what we have a picture of here are different varieties of native corn. Heirloom varieties, open pollinated. Um, some of them are orange, some of them are red, some are blue, some of them are white, some of them are mixed up. And each one of these um, corn has its own um, purpose. It has its own reason for being here. Um, some of them have their own ceremonies. Um, it's important for us to plant the foods that our ancestors um, brought here for us uh, because we have a genetic um, code and our body recognizes these foods. These foods are what we are meant to be eating. Um, we have the different colors of the corn give us different food types to eat too. Some of them are made for flour. Some of them are made for making bread. Some of them are made for making soup. Some of them are made for making mush. And some of them are just used during ceremonial time. So as my mom said, all of these seeds come from Sky Woman's body. Um, and they have an important meaning to us then as part of our creation and part of our identity. And we also have a relationship with these seeds that is uh, very familial. So we consider them to be part of our extended family, um, living beings that we care for so that they can continue to care for us. We give thanks that they carry out their responsibilities and that they nourish us. They really sacrifice themselves so that we can continue to live. And we know that we have a responsibility to the next generations of seeds and people so that they can continue that relationship into the future as well. 
So here we have uh, a conversation about the traditional methods of planting. Um, the land was cleared by the men. They prepared the fields for the women to plant on. Um, we planted the three sisters together, the corn, beans, and the squash. We used mounds um, to plant them in, and a fish was buried at the bottom of the mound to fertilize the plants. The corn was planted first, and then it, when it grew a little bit taller, the beans were planted, um, to, and the corn stalk was used as a pole for a pole beans. And then the squash was planted around the edge to keep the critters away, to keep the moisture in the soil, and to suppress the weeds. The beans also provided nitrogen to the corn, and they helped the corn stay steady during a, a windy time. Um, our people saved as much food as they could from season to season because they didn't know when disaster would strike. Uh, the villages were all made out of indigenous um, items uh, that could easily return back to the earth. So we would stay in one place for about 20 years until the soil was um, used up and then a whole village would be moved to a whole different site. The houses would be left behind, the palisade would be left behind, and a whole new um, village would be created in another area and the whole life cycle would start all over again. Um, it would usually take about three years for the men to build a village before we moved. So all of these decisions were made with um, the um, understanding that the, everyone works together cooperatively in order for everyone to survive. So everyone that planted corn had a role and responsibility from the oldest elder to the youngest child. And um, the boys would uh, be responsible for keeping the animals away. They would sit up all night like teenagers do. And their job was to scare the deer and the raccoons away. So everything was cooperative and to benefit the entire village. There was really no ownership. So each longhouse then was headed up by the woman, the matriarch of the family, and all of her daughters would be living with her in that um, longhouse and all of her granddaughters. And when someone got married, their husband would move into that longhouse with them. So that um, matrilineal connection extended through multiple generations in one house um, and sort of supported intergenerational learning, which is a keystone of cultural values that underpinned all of those practices. Another keystone is the ceremonial cycle. So we follow the ceremonies that were given to us, um, and those are to give thanks to all of the beings that we rely on and that rely on us. Um, and so we have a lot of ceremonies that follow the corn cycle, the planting cycle, and the harvest cycle um, to remind us that um, you know these foods, these beings are here um, uh, at their own will, and that we do have to give thanks to them. We have to respect their agency and respect all of the things that they sacrifice for us. Um, we also had communal work and distribution. So just like my mom was saying how everybody had a job, everybody also had a place to live, had food and health care and education. Um, and so it was a very communal way to take care of one another. Um, and it was something that uh, involved a lot of foresight because we're putting food away um, for the future in case there is a catastrophe and we're planning for the next seven generations. So when we pick up that village and move it, um, we're going around in a circle, and by the time we come back to that original site, um, it's completely reforested, um, regenerated. And so in that way, we never use up the resources of one place um, to complete depletion. So um, this is a, a discussion on our agriculture, but all of these um, life ways were really disrupted. And they were disrupted by um, uh, interruption of cultural teachings through land loss, um, religious um, pressure, and, um, and the boarding school era, which was um, really the final straw in breaking that intergenerational learning chain that had been going on for so many generations. So we were... Um, whoopsies. We <laughs> moved from upstate New York, or what is now upstate New York, to Wisconsin. Um, and that was through a treaty made with Menominee Nation. So um, we are on Menominee territory, technically. And um, that was a very treacherous journey to take at that time. Um, and the boat actually sank after we relocated. 
So um, we really give thanks to those um, ancestors that made it to Wisconsin and settled in Menominee territory and really saved those seeds that first winter so that we can continue growing them to this day. Um, we imagine that it would be a very difficult choice to decide whether or not to eat those seeds and uh, nourish yourself now or wait until spring and plant them um, ensure that those seeds are there for the next seven generations. So uh, we give a lot of um, homage to those people and to all of the people that followed that have carried on those traditions. And it's something that we think about in our cooperative. So when we got started, you know, we had a little handful of teachings and a handful of seeds that we got started with. And it's taken a lot of people teaching us a lot of aspects of cultural pieces, um, trading with us, um, bartering. We gathered up some wild rice and traded that for the corn seed that we started with on our first big field so that we could become self-sufficient with our seeds. Um, and it's really had a tremendous impact on us. So from the very beginning, we were thinking about those traditional teachings. We started out with some scrappy equipment that we got at, a, at an auction. Um, we got some fish fertilizer through a grant through a SARE program, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. And we used that um, cultural value of not letting anything go to waste by utilizing local fertilizer sources. So we used uh, organic chicken crumbles and horse manure and really anything that we can get our hands on or barter for um, to build the soil back up. We also started out using the traditional practice of rotating. So we can't pick up our whole village and move 20 or every 20 years anymore, but we can rotate our fields. So we will allow our fields to rest and plant cover crops in, the, in those times of rest so that we can make sure that we're treating the soil right along the way. So um, this is a, a picture of our, one of the ladies that's in our group. She's uh, very proficient at driving a tractor and um, she's mowing down the, the corn that we picked this fall. And there, on the back of it, there's a um, brush cutter that is returning the corn back to the soil. So um, behind her, there's corn on the stalks that hasn't been picked yet. And as you can see, they're all at different uh, levels on the corn stalk, which makes it impossible for us to use a corn picker to pick our corn. We have to pick it by hand. So um, some of our production practices that we have are raised beds, low or no-till, uh, crop rotations, and local soil amendments. So the raised beds is something new that we just started um, with um, this year, this season, and uh, we had some good results. Um, we had some not so good results with the same practice. The low no-till is a conservation planting that we're doing in one of our fields. We're using cover crops with our corn interseeding, and we're trying to create a space where we can um, grow the corn without having to use a ton of inputs like fertilizer. We don't have to run over the soil a lot of times with the tractor compacting the soil. Um, we've had some luck with that process, and, and this year we didn't, we didn't have good luck with it. So we're going to keep trying until we can get the right seed mixture with um, the corn that we grow. So corn is a grass and it needs a lot of attention. And um, we have a symbiotic relationship with our corn. We take care of the corn and the corn takes care of us. So the other practice that we're utilizing to call back to those traditional teachings is our cooperative structure. So when we got started, uh, we were just a few families growing corn in our backyards and getting just mauled by raccoons uh, and a lot of other issues with getting the corn to full maturity and having a good harvest. So when we decided to come together, the cooperative structure really made sense for us because we could adapt it to our teachings. And it sort of brought that communal element that we mentioned earlier into our practices. So everything that we're doing has a thread in those original teachings. So here we is our no-till experiments that we're doing. Um, in the lower picture, the um, we're, we're mowing down the cover crop um, and returning, we're leaving the cover crop on the soil so that it can be the green manure for the following year. Um, in the top picture, you can see we have the interseeding with the cover crop plants right in with the corn plants. And um, it's it's been re really interesting. Um, it's been a very big learning experience for us. 
Uh, we have really poor soil quality in the fields that were given to us by the tribe. And so we're trying to build up the organic matter. We're trying to reestablish the bio life that's in the soil um, because we understand that if you feed the soil, the soil will feed you. And um, we want to reduce the amount of labor that we're using to um, care for our plants. Um, weeding rows and rows of corn is very labor intensive, very time intensive. And um, we want to get to a point where we can plant the corn with a cover crop that will um, add nutrients back to the soil, keep the soil in place, um, reduce the runoff, and provide nutrients back to the soil for the time that we come back to that space. So um, we have some really good goals. We have some really great mentors. And we feel that if we keep trying this process, we're going to find the magic mix. So this is um, one of the fields that we were given by our tribe to use for free. Um, we broke it up into about three acre parcels and we um, have cover crop on four of the, or five of the six, and then we grow um, just one of those sections at a time and we rotate it every year. So we have two um, spaces on the left-hand side of the screen. We found that those were way too wet. So we're going to let that be just a hay um, cover crop and um, we'll be trading that hay for manure for that field to keep the nutrients going every year. Right, so some of those cuttings will be taken off the field for our friend who has horses, and then some of those cuttings will be left on the field to replace that green manure and return those nutrients back into the soil. And we are planning on continuing to perfect this method, hoping one day to have a perennial cover crop system that we then can drill the corn into. Um, so what we're doing right now in our main fields is going in and planting with a conventional planter and then going over with a cultivating tractor to suppress those weeds and then hand weeding uh, those rows as well. So every family adopts a few rows and takes care of those throughout the year. But it's very labor intensive, as you can imagine, hand weeding three acres of corn. Um, we definitely have done it in the past and it's been successful, but it is not a sustainable long-term solution for our group because we're all volunteers. And so we all have our own jobs and families and other responsibilities. Um, and we want to make sure that we're treating the corn in a good way. So if we can hit multiple goals at once and suppress weeds and build soil with these cover crops, that's a win-win-win for us. And so that's why we're so attracted to trying this method. Yep, so here's a demonstration of the bed shaper. Um, we went into our field and we, sh we did just a few sh beds, about six beds. And then we had this torrential rain come through, about four or five inches of rain, which is becoming more and more common with climate change. And our group was so excited to see that the corn stalks and the corn roots would be out of the water for the first time in that field. And um, if you look at the picture on the lower left-hand side, you'll see those same mound-type systems are growing in the Menominee Forest. And that is a growing um, system that's been around for thousands of years. So with this field, after we came in with the bed shaper, this field is separate than the field we're doing the cover crop experiments with. We came in and hand planted. So that top left corner is one of our um, co-op members and her two little ones who came through and hand planted some of the corn. And let me tell you, those little kids really planted the best, healthiest looking corn that came out of there. So they have really good energy that they put into the soil and we really appreciated having them out in the field. The one issue with the bed shaper that we have had is trying to um, control weeds in a system that um, is a little bit difficult to get into with any kind of equipment. So this whole field had to be hand weeded or weed whacked um, and it was extremely labor intensive. So we're gonna continue to tweak this approach to see if we can get to a point where it's a little bit lower on the labor intensivity and then a little bit higher in the yield. So here's an example of the children hand planting our soil. I mean, our plants, um, we're using open pollinated seeds, um, heirloom variety beans and squash that we can identify for our community. Um, and it's been a great learning experience. We have multi-generational families out in the field. Um, it keeps the connection going um, with our families and it's really building a sense of community. 
So after we get all of those plants in the ground and we spend all summer weeding them, it's time to go out and harvest. And this is really the most labor intensive time. So <laughs> the labor that we do over the summer is nothing compared to what goes into harvest because we hand pick all of our corn. So my mom mentioned that the corn grows in different areas on the stock. Well, it's also quite moist when it's ready for harvest. So it's about 50% moisture. So if we went in and picked it conventionally and threw it in a grain bin, it would be lost mold. So we follow the traditional practices of harvesting, getting together out in the field. Um, this year, socially distanced out in the field to pick um, our white corn and, and harvest it that way. And we really enjoy that experience of being able to be out there, um, hear the rustling of the leaves and feel the, the sun on our faces as we're picking this corn and um, really giving thanks while we're out there. Um, so um, we gather up the corn and then we pull back the husks and then we braid it up. And this braiding is a traditional practice to dry the corn out. The corn would usually be hung uh, in the inside of the um, longhouses with other foods that were drying. And that was because the smoke from the longhouse fires would keep all the insects off the food um, and would help uh, make sure that it dried without being attacked by any kind of insects or animals. So today we don't have the longhouse to hang our corn in. We use a barn, um, but we do barter for our access to this barn. Um, and when we hang up the uh, corn braids, we use uh, pie tins over the braids so that any kind of critters can't jump down onto the corn and um, eat all our little seeds up. So we're trying to remember those practices of protecting the corn, um, giving it time to dry down before storing it so that we don't lose it to mold. And it's a really nice time to share those teachings with the young ones. So we'll get all the kids together, get them in a circle and get them talking about corn and sharing what they know. And it's just amazing what in a few years they can pick up um, and be ready to tell back to you. So we really enjoyed having, you know, three, maybe four generations out there working together um, and passing on those traditions to the next generation. So then we select, as we're going through and husking all of these um, corn cobs, it's like a surprise every time where you're gonna get under that husk. And sometimes you get kind of a knobby looking corn like the one on the left, and that's still good. That's still good to eat. So we'll braid that up with what we call the soup corn because that's gonna be soup one day. And then we have some corn that looks really nice and straight, has eight rows, there's no dents. And those are exactly the traits that we're looking for for our seed. So we call that our seed corn. We braid that up separately and we put some really beautiful corn husk flowers on the top of that so we can tell the difference uh, come spring when it's all dried down. Um, and so we um, then divvy up all of this harvest based on the number of hours that were put into the co-op. So you might get your share of soup corn, but then you also get a share of seeds that are pr to protect in your house until the time that they're needed. And so we distribute all of that um, because it's part of our communal teachings. And it also makes sure that um, all of our seeds aren't in one house. If there was a catastrophe for some reason, um, that we wouldn't lose all of our seeds. And so we make sure that we're sort of following those teachings of thinking forward, um, thinking about uh, each other and, and then supporting each other. Um, we also try to make those seeds available to the community. Anybody who wants seeds in Oneida can reach out to us and we're happy to provide them. And then we also set aside a share of the corn that we process and then we give that out to the community members if there's a funeral. So in their time of mourning, they don't have to worry about tracking down uh, the corn that will have it there ready for them. So this, in this slide, we wanna talk with you about cultural regeneration. Um, in the picture on the right, you'll see an albino or a white um, corn plant. And that, that plant showed up in our fields last year and the year before, and we were really kind of puzzled. About what does this mean? What's going on with this seed? And so we reached out to our relatives out east and asked them about this, took pictures of it and said to them, and they told us that that was a blessing, that that is the spirit of the corn. The corn is in the field with us and she really likes what's happening. So we were really feeling good about the work that we were doing, how we were doing it, and uh, the work that we were completing. On the left-hand side, you'll see uh, round loaves. That's our bread. It's not baked in the oven um, like wheat bread is. It's made um, out of corn flour that's mixed with kidney beans 
and then patted together into wheels, that we call that a wheel, and then it's put into boiling water. And um, when we first moved to Oneida in 1993, the only time that you could get this Gunnestoha bread was at holiday time. There wasn't enough corn in our community for anybody to have Gunnestoha whenever they wanted it, unless they grew their own corn. So one of the, you know, factors for us to grow our own corn was to take that responsibility on for ourselves and to reconnect with our corn, reconnect with all the foods that it can provide for us, all the different varieties of ways that we can cook it. And it really provided a cultural regeneration. Um, we, as a group, Ohea Lagu went down to Ecuador and met with the tribal people down there, met with people from the Amazon, met with people that lived in the mountains, and we talked about corn and how important our, the cultural aspects of growing corn is to our culture and our community. And we learned that we process our corn the same way with the hardwood ashes. So we understand the continuum of, of lessons and how um, cultural knowledge is shared between peoples. In this photograph, um, this is my cousin Becky's kitchen and she started out growing white corn and then she got interested in um, trading white corn for other seeds. And she started growing different varieties of corn, beans, and squash. Um, she traded for maple syrup, pickles, tomatoes, jams, and jellies. Um, she has tobacco there and some dried fruit and vegetables. Um, so she can put any of these combinations together and make some really delicious meals for her family. And um, what this shows us is that, um, you know, the, the native foods are all slow foods. It takes a long time to prepare and cook them. And they are uh, not widely available. You can't go to the grocery store and buy white corn. You can't go to the grocery store and buy wild rice that's harvested from a lake from a tribal member. You can get commercially um, processed wild rice, but not, not the variety that, that we eat. Um, and so, you know, because there's a lack of these foods available to us, it's really important for us to take up that responsibility of growing those foods for ourselves and then teaching others how to grow them so that we have more food sovereignty, we have a seed bank, and we have the cultural awareness of our foods and the, the benefits that they bring to our diet. Um, the picture that I'm, I'm holding a basket, that is a basket that's made out of black ash. So if somebody went out to the woods, they put their tobacco down, they said a prayer, they took down an ash tree, they pounded the logs until they got the strips and then they wove a basket. So we like to recognize the other uh, tribal people that are doing cultural appropriate activities and making things that we can trade for or buy from them. Um, so this basket would be used for harvesting the corn, um, put it on your back and as you're walking through the corn stalks, you just pull the stalk off and throw it over your shoulder. And um, we are really learning a lot about traditional tools and tool making and how they can help us with projects that we're working on. And these uh, traditional tools also give us a chance to learn about our relatives beyond the field. So we started learning about corn, then we started learning about beans and squash, and now we're learning about the ash trees and how to make baskets with the ash trees. And we're learning about how to uh, make um, corn husk moccasins um, and corn husk mats um, and you're really using everything so that we're not leaving any waste behind um, and making sure that we're uh, really respecting uh, the sacrifices that these relatives are making for us. So it's it's definitely been uh, a great experience learning about all of these different relatives that uh, we know we have them but we don't have a relationship with them yet. So through the corn and through agriculture we're expanding that family, that plant family out into the forest as well. So this is a, a photograph of a bunch of tribes getting together to talk about corn in a program called Braiding the Sacred. And so you have Ojibwe people, Oneida people, Ho-Chunk people, uh, the, um, sorry, I can't remember their name. Winnebago. Winnebago, sorry. I only know their traditional name, Ho-Chunk. And um, we all got together. Uh, the Ho-Chunk Nation hosted us in Black River Falls, and we talked about corn and the corn culture, and we taught the ladies how to braid the corn. And um, they really enjoyed the lessons and wanted us to bring more corn to braid next time because they process their corn in a different way. They roast it or boil it, and then they use a spoon, and they take it off of the cob, and then they dry it. 
So we're learning so much from each other and different ways of processing the corn and different ways of cooking it. And it's really opening up opportunities for trade, um, learning from each other and, and sharing traditional knowledge. So we would be remiss if we didn't mention all of our allies and organizations that have supported us along the way. Um, first and foremost, Oneida Nation has given us several leases on land uh, for free so that our group can grow traditional foods together. And this has opened the door for other groups to form and access land holdings of the Oneida Nation uh, to further that food sovereignty vision. Um, we also have um, partnered with Braiding the Sacred, of course, on our events. And I talked about the SARE grant that we got to do the study on fish emulsion. So sustainable agriculture research and education, um, we consider a very good ally. And uh, the Great Lakes Commission as well has funded um, some of our projects to improve water quality through our practices. And none of that would be possible without the support of Intertribal Agriculture Council, which served as a fiscal sponsor, um, because we're still just a scrappy little grassroots group um, and we're not a formalized 501c3 nonprofit or anything like that. So anytime we go after grants, we have to ask partners to support us in that. And we're really grateful for that kind of support. So and Yonko, this is the end of our, yep, Bianco, thank you for joining us. I hope we were able to uh, share some knowledge with you so you could better understand us. And um, I hope you have a great, um, an opportunity to share and try native foods in the future. Onokiwa, goodbye. Hi, I'm Ben Fuda, host of Let's Grow Stuff. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this year's virtual Wisconsin Garden and Landscape Expo. Well, we just learned, finished learning about indigenous regenerative agriculture, and Laura and Leah are now joining us live to answer the questions that you were sending in during their presentation. Don't forget, you can keep asking those questions as we're chatting either through the live stream on YouTube or on the PBS Wisconsin Facebook page. Laura and Leah, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Happy to be here. It's great to be here. <laughs> well, well, we'll just we'll just dive right in. We've got some great questions here. Uh, so Julie is asking, and uh, Laura, I'll, I'll pitch this first one to you. Any tips on sure. uh, doing three sisters in a smaller space? Maybe if someone's growing in, in a city or an urban area. Sure. So you want to have at least uh, ten rows um, by ten rows. So you'd have a hundred mounds, which seems like a lot, um, but you really need to have that many mounds so that you have a chance for your open pollinated corn to pollinate each other. Um, and uh, uh, you want to plant your corn first and let it grow a few inches, and then you can go ahead and put your beans in. Uh, don't put in a really aggressive bean that will tear your corn stalks down. Now, you know, try to find one that's not too aggressive. And then lastly, you put in your squash plants just around the perimeter of, of the mounds, so just around the edges. And that'll help shade out the weeds and keep the soil, soil more, moist. Excellent. Uh, Leah, I'll, um, Lucy on Facebook is asking, how did you go about building relationships with everyone that you trade with? So you mentioned seeds and fertilizer. Um, it sounds like you have an awesome community and you're doing some great work, but sort of how did you start to build those community connections? Absolutely. So we're really lucky that there are a lot of indigenous agriculture events that we go to. So there's intertribal food sovereignty summits that happen in the Great Lakes area that Intertribal Agriculture Council puts on. Um, and there's gatherings of native farmers and organic growers all over the place. So the Midwest Organic um, Moses Conference is coming up right around the corner. Um, that's a really good way to just interact with other farmers and see what's available for trade. I think if you don't have access to um, those kinds of events, even just going to farmer's market and striking up a relationship with other farmers, see what they're growing and see if they'd be interested in trading. Um, I think it's becoming a lot more popular again. I think it was at once really, really popular um, and it's coming back around to that as well. Excellent. Uh, Laura, Sherry is asking, I'm a teacher and she would love her elementary students to learn more about everything you're doing. Um, where might she turn for guidance or for more resources to, to help her students learn about this? Uh, there's a lot of really good learning tools online. Um, because Three Sisters Gardening has been written about and talked about many, many different ways for different grade levels, um, she should be able to find all the resources that she needs there. 
Excellent. Uh, Leah, I'll pitch this one to you. So we have a couple questions on cover crops from Audrey and Helen. They're wondering what are you using as the actual cover crop species, but also what is the timing for that? Is that a spring or a fall or both? So the answer is it's complicated. It depends. Um, we've tried a lot of different approaches. So we've tried interseeding clover in between the rows. That worked really well for us. Uh, what didn't work well for us was planting a hairy vetch. That was um, really hard to get rid of in the springtime. So we planted that in the fall. In the spring, we came in, we wanted to put our corn in, and the hairy vetch was really hard to kill off. So you don't want to plant a cover crop that's going to compete with your corn or your beans or your squash. You want to plant something that's going to work really well with it. So what we're experimenting with this year is we're going to put our corn in and then we'll go back in and interseed with three different species. So we're putting in plantain, clover, and a chicory. And so that makes sure that you have a nice little ecosystem of different species available that'll add different things to the soil, help build a diverse soil bacterial community. Um, and then this fall, we're going to harvest our corn early in the green corn stage, and then we'll put in an aroostook rye. And we'll wait for that. That'll grow all winter long. Actually, if you dig into the snow, it'll still be green under the snow. And in the springtime, that'll uh, mature nice and early so we can come in with a roller crimper and tamp that down into like a mat. And then we're working with the county to use a conservation planter that can plant right into that cover crop. So that'll help us with weed suppression and it'll add a green manure back into the soil. And actually, I have a follow-up from Maureen on that, actually. So Leah, I'll, I'll keep going to you for this one. Have, um, she's wondering it, why you choose cover crops over mulching as, as a way to sort of keep uh, build soil and keep weeds down. So we're really trying to um, build up our soil deep down even. We have very compacted soils, we have very unhealthy soils, and the more living roots that we have in the soil, the more that will help that microbial community come back to life and help the soil come back to life. So mulching is another good option if you don't have a cover crop that's gonna work well with what you're planting. It does add organic matter back to the soil, but we're really trying to get the living roots in the soil to hold it in place, especially because we have those heavy rains. Um, and that helps us reduce erosion and um, you know, help us keep from compacting the soil when we go back in with equipment. So Laura, um, Audrey is asking, um, you had that great image of uh, one of your fellows on, on the tractor, you know, getting the fields ready. And she's wondering, um, before, before, you know, this mechanized equipment, sort of what types of tools or things did you use to get the field prepared and ready for planting? Sure. So back in the village life, uh, it was actually the men's responsibility to prepare the fields for the women. And they would um, have to use tools to knock the trees down and then we'd use fire to um, burn the trees out and then they'd have to get the roots out. And the women would use tools that were made out of antlers and the um, shoulder bone of a buffalo. So most people think that buffalo are only uh, Plains Indians animal, but there's actually woodland buffalo as well. And that was part of our diet. So in keeping with our tradition of using everything that you have, all of the hand tools were made from animal parts and, and shells. Anything that was sharp that we could use to dig into the ground. Excellent. Uh, Leah, another uh, question on um, the three sisters. And Wendy is wondering, is there anything or, or specific variety she can look to for squash that won't also grow up the corn stalk, something that you know, stays more at ground level? So the squash, as long as you're sticking with one variety of squash, you shouldn't have too much of an issue with it. Um, some squash do like to climb up, but if you choose a winter squash, um, you shouldn't have too much of an issue with them trying to climb up. Um, but yeah, the important thing is you don't want two kinds of squash because if a bee comes by and pollinates one flower and goes to the next flower and cross pollinates your squash seeds, you're going to have some real funny looking squash the second year around. All right, and then uh, Jill is wondering too, when it comes to actually out in the field, you mentioned sort of protecting your harvest from critters indoors once they're drying, but do you, how, how do you approach that when they're outdoors, when they're still growing in the field from raccoons or anything that might be hungry? Sort of how do you approach that? Um, Laura, how, what, how does that look? Well, in our culture, you plant seven seeds and you get to harvest one of them for yourself. So all of the other six seeds go to feed our relatives, the raccoons and the deer and whoever else comes along. We have, we have bugs that come and eat our corn, um, birds that come and eat our corn seeds. So really, um, we're, we're feeding 
all of the natural world when we plant the corn. We're not just feeding ourselves. Um, we have set out traps for raccoons. Um, they really like to attack our corn right when it's just about ready to be picked and they always go for the best cobs. And if our corn is anywhere near a GMO field, they'll eat our corn before they'll eat a GMO corn because our corn is so good. So um, yeah, we just have to keep in mind that we have to feed everyone, not just ourselves. And it's really heartbreaking um, because sometimes the raccoons will wipe out an acre of corn in, or half acre of corn in one day. And, and some people lose their entire field and it's hard to remain positive about that because you were counting on that corn for ceremonies or to feed your family or whatever. And so um, the raccoons are teaching us a lesson that we need to grow enough for everyone, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but that's how we do it. Some people have to resort to putting up an electric fence around their cornfield because the amount of loss is just so huge they can't sustain it. So um, when you're growing by yourself, you have to really think about um, pest control. Yeah, I think that's something um, for, for all gardeners to think about and keep in mind is how we're nurturing everything around us, not just ourselves. Uh, Leah, we yeah. have got a, a question here, um, sort of a uh, viewer interested in the harvest season. So what does that season look like? So from uh, when does it begin, when does it end, um, but sort of that, that process? Absolutely. So our first harvest is for the green corn, and that's when the green the corn is in this green milky stage. The cob will still be green, and the corn is kind of like sweet corn. So we have a ceremony for that, and we harvest that um, like late summer, and then we'll grill that up and put that in soups and all different kinds of things. Um, and then our full harvest usually happens at the end of September, sometimes into October, depending on how the season's going. And that's when the corn has formed its nice hard shell around each kernel, it's a flint corn. And so we harvest that for, it takes us weeks and weeks and weeks to harvest it. We have several harvest events where the community is welcome to come and join us and help us with all that hard work and sit down and visit and have a nice time. And we feed everybody corn soup and it's a really nice couple of uh, weekends that we have. And um, that process involves harvesting it, pulling off the most of the husks and then braiding the corn together. So you end up with this long braid of 30 to 60 cobs that you then hang up. Sounds, sounds like a fun time uh, being out there and being in community. <laughs> um, Laura, Mohammed has a question about um, the, the villages. So when, when you were moving villages, so how, how far did you move? Um, sort of what was, that, what was that process like? Well, the, the move would be um, the game that was around the longhouse area would have been um, depleted. So the men would walk until they could find game again. So you need to be around fresh water. Um, you need to be around uh, a place that's fairly protected, um, you know, from the, the wind and all the elements and everything. So they would go scouting for areas that they would want to move to. So um, I would imagine it would be at least 10 to 15, 20 miles away from where the original uh, village was. And, um, you know, our diet consisted of over 3,000 different items, uh, all the different fish, all the different waterfowl, all the different berries, nuts and fruits, um, all the food that we grew. Um, so we had an amazing diet uh, and we um, contribute that to the success of our people and to the birth of democracy. So when you think about the United States Constitution, you really have to refer back to our great law of peace that we have that governs our people and our, our chief system. And so because we had all those nutrients and all those healthy foods, um, we were really able to develop our minds, our culture, our arts and crafts, um, politics, everything. Because we had the abundance, we, our men only worked uh, 10 hours a week uh, caring for the people. The women only worked an average of 12 hours a week and the rest of the time was used to um, develop whatever your arts and interests were. So we were very fortunate that um, we lived that way. I think that sounds like something a lot of people would be uh, interested in these days. Um, and, and on that note, sort of as, as a follow up, if someone is interested in getting involved with the work that you're doing, um, how, how can they contact you and reach you? Sort of how do they get involved? So we have a Facebook page. It's a public Facebook, Facebook page called Ohela Goo. And they're welcome to drop a comment in there and Leah or myself will be responding. We usually post our yeah. events in there. 
uh, when we have a public event. Uh, unfortunately, this past season, we weren't able to have any public events because of the COVID. So we always keep our community in mind, our guests in mind, and, and try to keep everybody safe. So hopefully with the vaccine rollout this year, we'll be able to get together again in the fall and share our knowledge with other people. Excellent. And we just have a few minutes left, and I've got a couple more questions for you both. But as we're starting to wrap up, I want to remind viewers that um, you can view these presentations if you want to reference something or go back and say, wait, what was that thing they mentioned? All of these presentations will be available online at uh, wisconsingardenexpo.org slash schedule. And also will be posted on YouTube and Facebook as well in the coming days. So stay tuned for that. And you can always come back and reference these questions. So in our final moments, again, uh, Leah, I'll, I'll toss this one to you, a question about sourcing seeds. So as, if people are looking to source, um, again, non-GMO seeds or heritage seeds, how do, we, how do folks know what's reputable? Where should they look? Absolutely. So there's a couple of bigger names that are really reputable. So Seed Savers Exchange is a good place to get seeds. Their catalog is insane. You can get almost anything out of that. Um, and a lot of heritage seeds, a lot of old seeds. Um, and then I would just re really recommend to look around for local seed companies because you're going to want a seed that is adjusted to our climate and adjusted to growing in our area. You don't want seeds that are grown in California. You don't want seeds that are grown in the Southwest. You want something that can handle all the weather that we get up here in the Great Lakes area. So um, North Circle Seeds is a good one. I know there's a lot of other little smaller seed outfits that take a lot of pride in growing seeds in an ethical way. So I would just, you know, jump online and look for local Midwestern seed company. And the more local, the better. So my final question for both of you, and we'll start with you, Laura, what has surprised you along this journey? Sort of what has been interesting or most eye-opening for you? Um, I think like the most eye-opening thing for me was um, that how this corn has taken us places. So I never would have guessed that the corn would take us to Ecuador or to Mexico. And the, the learning that we've come to um, enjoy, the, the opening of our minds and the opening of, of our hearts and minds to other people and the way that they grow things and the way that they live, that's really invaluable. So for people who get a chance to travel and they get to go um, to different countries and, and not in a in a resorty kind of way where you're in a gated community, but really get out and meet with the people. Um, you just add so much to your own life. And so the corn, I, I wanted I wanted to start growing it because I was, you know, really adamant about it. I really needed to grow it for myself and I needed to grow it with my community. But the benefits that I've gotten that have absolutely nothing to do with eating the corn. Um, or, or the physical act of growing it, but just the spirituality of it and, and the sharing of culture is, it's just amazing. So I, I highly recommend that people look at your own culture, look at your own um, heritage seeds and grow the food that your people ate. It doesn't have to be our food, it can be your food too. And, and really reconnect with your own uh, ways and your own people. And Leo, in just a few seconds, anything that's really stuck out to you, maybe 20 seconds, what surprised you? Um, I just love how much community has come around the corn. You know, we thought, oh, we'll start growing corn together. But now we help each other out in all different kinds of ways. And we really have a tighter knit community out of it. And I'm just so grateful for that. Well, Laura and Leah, thank you so much for being with us today, for sharing your knowledge, your experience, and your expertise. We appreciate it so much. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go. You bet. Well, please stick around. We've got more presentations coming up after this and also the virtual live streaming of our exhibitor booths. So please stay tuned.